Yes? Okay, page two. Here we go. Please feel free to jump in and say, what about this or what about that? Right. Sign of X, uh, at least in the other class, they said I gave them the summation wrong in their notes or something. That's why you can't copy the notes, but maybe. Okay? Do you have this in your brain yet? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, X to the, now it kind of depends on if you're starting at zero or not. I'm going to start at zero. Now if I start at zero and I want to get odds, my choices are 2n plus 1 or 2n minus 1. If I start at zero, what should I use? 2n plus 1. If I started at, if you have 2n minus 1, then what should your starting value be? 1. Okay, so there are two possibilities. But if I start at zero, it's most common to start it at zero because that's how the Taylor series starts. F at zero, no derivative, and zero is derivative if you like, and goes on. So I will most commonly use zero. The denominator is the same, 2 n plus 1 factorial. Question, negative 1 to the n or to the n plus 1? Or n minus 1. Negative 1 to the n. n. Now, um, just so I'm clear, in the last class, I felt like it's, gosh, it's a 50-50 shot. I hope I get it right. It's not a 50-50 shot. You can know if you did it right or not if you just simply check. When n equals 0 goes in, it would be negative 1 to the 0, which is positive 1. And therefore, it works. And plus 1 would be negative 1 to the, to the 1. That's negative. That doesn't work. So it's not a, I hope it works thing. It's a, it works because you check to make sure it works. You follow me? Okay. <clears throat> Cosine is even power. Cosine is even function, including x to the 0, which is an even number. 0 is an even number. 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial, cha, cha, cha. x to the even is 2n. 2n factorial. That means I started at 0. x to the 0 over 0 factorial is 1. I know that's weird. 0 factorial is 1. You can talk about that if you like. But it is true. Negative 1 to the what? n or n plus 1? <coughs> n, yeah? Do you agree? Does that check? Does that work? It does. And that's assuming starting at zero. All right. E to the x is one. It's all positive. No alternating negatives in here. No. <coughs> one plus x to the first over one factorial plus x squared over two factorial plus, generally speaking, x to the n over n factorial. Again, no negative one to the anything. It doesn't have an alternating negative. And again, that's starting at zero. <coughs> you follow? And last but not least, 1 over 1 minus x, the Abraham of all series. 1 plus x plus x squared plus x to the n equals x to the n starting at 1. Here we go. I'll be down. I'm losing your brain. If I gave you a quiz when you walked in tomorrow, I'm going you smoke it. Not literally, of course. You're good? Okay. <coughs> Maybe that's coming this week. Hint, hint. Uh, write the series used to find the sign of 3. Uh, so when I say series, I mean the McLaurin series. So you're using this series with not an X, generally speaking, but specifically at an X of <laughs> 3. So the sign of 3 is approximated by 3 minus 3 cubed over 3 factorial plus 3 to the fifth over 5 factorial. Um, the first three terms of that, generally, just look at the general term and instead of x, use a 3. So negative 1 to the n, 3 to the 2n plus 1 over plus one factorial. Same deal, the same as the original summation, just instead of an x, it's a three. Cool. All right.
right again. <clears throat> Fifth degree Maclaurin series to estimate the sine of three. Now this, later on, you would actually not be an error to say sine of three is this if I went infinitely long, because it does converge for all real. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. But now, fifth degree Maclaurin, sine of three to be approximated by a fifth degree Maclaurin. You could use T of five because it is a table, even if it's under zero. Or you could use M of five. Or you could not use any notation and you just start rolling with three minus three cubed over three factorial plus three to the fifth over five factorial. That is 21 quarters, if I'm not mistaken. Or a little above 45. We? Oui? Alrighty then. <coughs> now then, um, if you were to, I personally did this this way in my calculator. I put f1 is sine, and f2 is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. I looked at the graph because I thought it was cool, and I'm a nerd, but it looked like this. Three, I think you'll agree, is about here-ish. And when I went to graph that x to the fifth e kind of polynomial, a positive x to the fifth flavor, it looked like that. It fit perfectly at zero. But the further and further and further out from zero, it started to get a little divergent from the sum. Now that's what you'll see in the table. At two, which is the closest to where they perfectly fit, it went from 0 0.90 for sine to 0 0.93 for my polynomial. There were only three hundredths different at that stage. At two, which is about here, they were pretty doggone close. <clears throat> at 2.5, they were, I did some major rounding and truncating here, so I just, I just went to where they started to differ and I wrote that much and then I stopped. So at 2.5, they were more like, instead of 300s different, they were more like 210. At 2.9, they were 3 tenths different. At 3, they were 4 tenths different. And then 5 tenths different, which seems like a linear pattern, but then they started to really separate, we're starting to get into this territory here, where they started to separate pretty hardcore from negative 0 0.3 to positive 0 0.7. They were one apart then, and then they started to get more and more distant. You follow me? Are you with me? Yeah. This class is a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, show the error in your estimate. Now, you estimated, you're trying to estimate the sine of 3, and we said the sine of 3 is about 21 quarters. That's this guy here, 0 0.546, whatever it was. Okay? It seems like, looking at my table, which was grossly rounded, that it's, the error is about 0 0.4. Okay? So it seems like it would be true that the error is less than half. We're just proving that to be the case. And here's what we first have to do. Meet the conditions first. Now, when I say... Uh, meet the conditions for a series error bound. Am I going all the way up to my general Maclaurin and talking about this series? Or am I talking about the numerical series of three? This one. I'm, this is the one I'm talking about. This series here that I'm using to estimate the sine of three, first of all, is alternating. <coughs> so here's a measure of whether you're a thinker or you can add Okay, look at this here. From here to here, by what factor did the top go? That's three squared. That's three to the third, not thirty three, by the way. It grew by two threes. Do you agree? It grew by a factor of nine. The denominator, what did it grow by? It went from one to six. So it grew by a factor of six. The top grew by a factor of nine. The bottom grew by a factor of six. Did it just get bigger or smaller? It got bigger. Okay? So it makes me, if you have any brains in your head, you should be at this stage going, I don't know, and be thinking about it. Look on, though. Which will eventually win? The exponential in the numerator or the factorial in the denominator? The factorial will win. Look at the next two. 
The top is growing by another couple of trees. The top is growing by a factor of nine. But now the denominator is growing by another four and a five. Now the denominator is growing by a factor of 20. So which one wins now with the denominator that's starting to get smaller? From here on, it's starting to get smaller. So you can be confident that event goes to infinity. The terms do go to zero. And this one, you have to be careful. If I write this, then I just lost at least for some point, because that is only true for after the second. <coughs> and it is not generally true at all this true, because it did actually grow the second term more than the first, not less. It was only after the second term where the term really did start to decrease. The whole idea being that's a guarding against trying to error bound an infinite sum. You can't Try, you can't, a series that grows infinitely large can't be bound in error because you can't expect it. Right? <coughs> Those conditions are there to keep you from trying to error bound an estimate if it's impossible. All right. Therefore, it is the case that S minus S2, 3, or 5. A median subscript on F is it of the number of terms in the estimate or the power of the last term. Number of terms. So should I be using three or five? Three. Um, you might also, in some text, uh, see this as a little more specific. They might say something like, or X, which is actually the true thing you're trying to find, the true sign of three, and my estimate, 21 thirtieths. That's the same as the true infinite sum and my estimate. The difference or the error between the true infinite sum and my estimate must be less than or equal to A4, or the next omitted, or the first omitted term. <coughs> I didn't show the first omitted term or the fourth term. What is the fourth term? Absolute value. Mm -hmm. True, just in terms of where it comes from. Where does it come from? 3 to the seventh over 7 to the fourth. <laughs> Um, 3 to the 7th over 7 factorial. You could slap it in your calculator and get a decimal. My calculator gave me a fraction of 243 over 560. It said show the error is less than a half. Well, I just showed that the error is less than 243 over 560. Isn't that less than a half? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so just so we're clear, there's a right way and an idiotic way to say this. That number represents the error bound, not the error. If you say the error is, then you are an idiot. Sorry. Because if you knew the error, then wouldn't you know the actual thing? And why are you estimating at all? Right? It's the error bound. The error is not more than 243,560. It's not the error is 243,560. Do you understand? Great. The energy in this class is palpable. I'm All right. Yes, hit me. So for something like that, if you, like, if you have a calculator and you know the sign of three, why can you just, like, find the error? Good question. Um, you, with your calculator, you could. You would be yeah. calculating correctly. Uh, it's just something like this. It's a good point. That's all right. So these would be, uh, it's because... First of all, these were before calculus time, so you love to be to be bound to kind of thing if you didn't know. But this is what allows the calculator to actually find it. Okay? So I understand you could technically with the calculator find the error um, and not bound it, but please don't be uh, no calculator expert. Um, what are two ways to get less error? What are two ways to get less error? Different center. Different center. And when different center, what kind of center would you want to choose? Closer to what you're estimating, okay? Or what else? More terms. All right. Now, uh, improving by using a different center. Uh, quite a few people that I talked to yesterday and helping them in seventh hour were going a little too fast here, and they were saying, all right, so, all right, now I'm going to use pi as the center, so it's 
uh, and it's sine, so it's x minus pi to the first uh, minus x minus pi cubed over 3 pi. Well, how are you getting that? I have no idea how you're getting that. The derivative, to expect all the derivative terms to be the same, even though you're changing the center, that's bogus, man. You can't assume that the derivative is one now. You're not doing them according. You have to go back and actually think about the derivative. That's a big fat no. F at pi is the sine of pi, and that is zero. F prime at pi is cosine of pi, and that's not a positive one starting term. That's you okay? Oh, okay. I looked over there and I didn't see you. I kept on the ground. Okay. So it's negative one. You will find then that these actually start negative. It's negative x minus pi to the first over one factorial. And do take the time to at least think about are the derivatives going to change? The answer is usually yes. When you choose a different center, your derivatives are going to be totally different. They're not McLaurin terms anymore. It's different. Okay? Uh, minus x minus pi to the fifth over 5 factorial. Dot, 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 dot. Generally speaking, it's x minus pi to the... It's still odd, and I'm still going to go 2n plus 1 with a starting n of 0. But now, this negative 1, I'm going to be careful with negative 1, assuming again that I'm starting at n equals 0, would negative 1 to the n work? Would negative 1 to the n be a positive first term? Now I have to get a negative first term. So this should be n plus 1 minus 1. That's what I'll say. Okay. All right then. So the sine of 3 could be approximated by negative. I'm using. 3 in place of x, and so instead of x minus pi, it's 3 minus pi to the first, plus 3 minus pi cubed over 3 pi, minus 3 minus pi to the fifth over 5 pi. So, All right. Um, so we will then, if we were to estimate the difference for the error in our estimates of different values around 3, <clears throat> where would it fit perfectly? Where would our Taylor fit the sign perfectly? Pi. It would fit pi perfectly. <coughs> 3 is pretty goddamn close. So it should fit around pi really, really well. And instead of the further from 0 of the words of fit, the further from pi to fit, we should see happening. At 2, for example, there was a good bit of error, it was about 28 off. But if you went to 2.5, my difference there wasn't until the infinite like 10 thousandths, or 100 thousandths place, excuse me, 100 thousandths place, it was 59847 there, and 59848 there. They were only off by 100 thousandths at 2.5. Here, they were accurate or the same until I got to, I think, the millions place or the ten millions place, two, three, nine, two, four, nine, three, two, versus da, 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 three. Okay. They were accurate or close to each other to the tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, three and ten millions. They were less than or one hundred millions off at that point. This um, I barely had any difference. It was way out there. Uh, very small slash no noticeable difference difference at least in my calculator I know there is a difference because it's only perfectly fitting a pi but uh, <coughs> my calculator didn't pick it up and after I started to get away from 3.14 then I started to get a difference of being negative 3.50732 and negative 0.35783 and okay, are you with me? All right. Now, uh, I don't. I used to think, well, this is obvious, but I don't know how obvious it is. Let's talk about convergence and error and all this stuff. Then. 
In the previous one, we were trying to estimate the sine three with a Maclaurin and this is our suit that follows. Now in those, the numerator was pretty substantial. This came from the difference between three and our center of zero and three minus zero to, and three minus zero to the fifth. You, you cool? Now because of the numerator being big, this converged slowly. The, the, the numerator was getting pretty stinking big. And now think about all the terms we left off. We left off in our estimate infinitely many terms. And because of that three to the seventh, which is big, and all those terms are pretty large. We left off a lot of terms incorporating a ton of errors. Look, however, when we use pi, how big is three minus pi? Zero point one four, yeah. right? About one tenth. This is one tenth to the first. This is one tenth to the third. One thousandth divided by three factorial. These are getting small quickly, and more importantly, think about all those terms. Those terms are microscopic. This is pretty much the meat of our estimate here. This is getting really close. And all these terms are so small, 0.14 to the seventh. That's 100 millionth I just left off, divided by seven factorial. I'm leaving off practically nothing. My answer is really, really close here because the series I'm using now has really small numerators and the error is really small as well. In fact, the first term I leave off, which represents an error bound, will be very small. The error bound is this one. <clears throat> Wouldn't you agree that here, this is an alternating series? Uh, fun fact, does it start off negative or positive? It starts off positive because it is pi is negative, negative means negative, positive. Do the terms go to zero? Oh boy, and how now? There's no, I wonder if it goes to zero with a factorial because it's 0.14 cubed over a factorial. It's definitely going to zero. And the terms are most definitely increasing. There's no iffiness now with this set of terms. So it is the case that s minus s3, or if you like, sine of 3 minus whatever this is. I don't, I didn't calculate. Did I calculate that? What did you get from this estimate here? I didn't actually do my calculator, my bad. Uh, is less than or equal to a4. a4 being the first omitted term, which is 3 minus pi to the 7 over 7 factorial. Again, that's like 0.1 to 7. 10 million divided by 7 factorial. That error is less than 100 million. Something more like an order of a billionth of an error. You follow me? Okay. Cool. Moving on to page 3. Page 3. Um... First of all, cosine of 32 degrees using 32 degrees, you will need to convert each, convert everything to radians. Why is that? Just because I want to make your life harder? Yeah. No. Yeah. We talked about this already. What's the derivative of cosine when you're in degrees? Not negative sine. Right? Talked about that? Or do we need to talk about that again? If you if you say graph, if you graph cosine in degrees in a normal 10 by 10 window, what does the graph look like? It, it looks pretty much straight because it's not going to hit 90 degrees until way over there. So in the window you'll see, it would look straight. Now think about also if you did sine. If you graph sine, Again, it's not going to peak the way over there, so even sine would look like this. It's barely going up, not even noticeable how slow it goes up because it's going to take forever until it gets up to 90 degrees. You with me? All right. Now the question then is, think about what the slopes would look like on a one-to-one -one basis on that versus in radians. In radians. And it's roughly gone through a couple cycles here 
So it's maybe gone through that much and that much. And when I draw the slope in radians on sine, that slope is pretty much, you know, and if you did this on graph paper, the slope there is one. And so if I were to record derivative values, it's one. And here, it's zero. And here, it's negative one. And so, is the derivative of sine cosine when you're in radius? Yes, it is. Okay? But, if you're in... I'm now looking for sine cosine. If you're in degrees, what is the derivative at zero now? It's not one. looks more like barely above one. So if you were to graph this, if you were to graph the derivative there, it would actually look something more like this, which is to say the derivative of sine when you're in degrees is cosine times pi divided by 180. It is very, very, very small. The biggest that slope ever gets is about 160. Okay, so my point being is this. All calculus is dependent on you being in radius when you do the curve. Okay? It all falls apart. The derivative of sine is not cosine if you're in degrees. So, the first thing you should do is say 32 degrees is the same as 30 degrees plus 2. You got me there, but I was thinking in radians. It would be 32 pi over 180, wouldn't you agree? Okay, what should we choose for our center? Our center of, actually I already told you, 30 degrees is the center and radians is pi over 6 or 30 pi over 180 if you like. Now when I have a center of 0, I can perform, I get sine of 0 and cosine of 0, negative sine of 0 and negative cosine of 0. And because of that, I get zeros every other term, and it alternates. It's either x to an even power for cosine or x to an odd power for sine, right? Because of the zeros in the derivative, right? Right. Here I'm taking derivatives at 30 degrees, 5 or 6. Well, I get zeros, and therefore this even or odd kind of thing, or am I going to get every term? My point is this. Don't expect cosine to always be x to the second, x to the fourth, x to the fifth. If you center it somewhere else, it's at zero, it won't be just even or just odd. It'll be more complicated than that, and you best slow yourself down. So, cosine at the center of pi over 6. What is cosine of pi over 6, or the first value? Root 3 over 2. The first derivative is negative sine at pi over 6. That's negative 1 half. The second derivative is negative cosine at pi over 6. That's negative root 3 over 2. Now, I didn't tell you how many terms to use. I apologize for that. But I went through a, a full cycle. So one more would be a full cycle of back to where we started. It goes positive 3, pos negative 1, negative 3, positive 1. So once you're back to the third derivative, I think you'll see the full. Yep. Therefore, using the Taylor series formula, I'll first write it as any x, and then I'll use the x. Okay, so you write the series first, and then you worry about the 32 degree x. Don't try to do all that at once. Do not, right? So Taylor is f at, f at pi over 6, which is root 3 over 2. Right? Or no, maybe you need to write this up here. The next is the derivative times x minus c to the first over 1 of factorial. So what's the next term in my series? f times c is 
negative 1 half, x minus pi over 6 to the first over one factorial. Okay? The next term, what is positive or negative? Negative. Root 3 over 2 is the derivative term. x minus pi over 6 to the second over 2 factor. And the last one I'll write is positive 1 half x minus pi over 6 to the third over 3 factorial. Technically it goes forever. Uh, overachiever, you say, what about the general term? Well, you don't write a general term in problems like this. It doesn't matter. You don't need to. Okay? Now, that said, that's my Taylor. Now I will use it to estimate the cosine of 32 degrees. The cosine of 32 degrees in radians is the cosine of 32 pi over 180. I'm going to approximate that with my Taylor at an x of 32 pi over 180 and see what the Taylor would give me. Well, that would be root 3 over 2 minus 1 half <coughs> of 32 pi over 180 minus pi over 6 to the first minus root 3 over 4, if I combine the root 3 over 2 with the 2 factorial, times x minus pi over 6 with an x of 32 pi over 180 to the second, plus 1 half and 3 factorial, 2 factorial 6, so that would be 1 12, 32 pi over 180, minus pi over 6 to the third. I don't know if you can plot that in your calculator or not, but let me say one more thing and then I'll move along. What is 32 pi over 180 minus pi over 6? Each of these little differences is very small, and that's because it shows a good center. The difference between what we're trying to estimate and the center is very small. That makes for a very quickly converging series, which makes for a very good estimate. Um, minus root 3 over 4 times pi over 90 to the second, plus 112 pi over 90 to the third. Just think about, even if we, even if we uh, could error bound this, think of all the terms we're leaving off here. They're all really small. I mean, pi over 90 is like a 30th. And the next term I'm leaving off is a 30th to the fifth power. And that's practically nothing. So I can be sure that these terms are playing a pretty doggone good estimate because everything left off is pretty small. Right? Could we use an alternating series error bound? The answer is, is no. You don't do that. Now, technically, you could. How could you? Think creative. But at some levels, you would try and do an alternating series error bound. Is it alternating technically the way it is? You could. Could you rearrange it, however, so it is? Yes. You could. You could actually rearrange it so it's the evens together and they alternate, and the odds together and they alternate. You actually get two error bounds for each of those series and accumulate that for a grand error bound. You could do that. Uh, we don't do that. Uh, but in science applications, I imagine it would be possible, especially when you didn't actually know the real thing. Um, you had to get a good estimate. All right, so the answer to this is no, it's not alternating. So technically, it could be. All right. Um, again, I understand that you just wrote these, but I want you, the more you write them, the more you remember them. So sine, most people started at 0, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. 
cosine also starts at zero. This even power goes to our 2n, 2n factorial, and it's negative 1 to the n because it needs to start positive. Uh, e to the x has no alternating negative. It's just x to the n over n factorial. <coughs> and 1 over 1 minus x is just a very simple x to the n, n factorial. Is it not an equation for integral one? Uh, I think in, uh, no, it's just a question. As, as long as you adapt it, your formula will be different. If you, if you started this, <laughs> if you started this at 1, but made no changes here, that actually. No, I get it for sine and cosine for the other. Two. For these? Yeah. They have to start at 0. Oh, okay. Otherwise, you wouldn't get, the first term in the least sequence is 1, okay. not x to the first over 1. So you're not getting the first term by okay. Yeah, so that, it definitely has to start here. Okay? Um, so make sure you change that. Okay. Um, now, this uh, goes to the last kind of lead end of the day here. Um, looking back at this, and think back to that 3 to the n, 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. For sine, which has a mixture of exponential in the top and factorial in the bottom, is there any place where x was such a big base that the exponential would kill the factorial, or would factorial always win no matter how big the x is? The factorial would always, factorial is always more powerful than the exponential in the top no matter how big x is. So this, I believe, would converge for all x's, which is to say that I could use my Taylor series to try and estimate any sine value, even the sine of 100,000 radians. I it would take me a gob of terms to get out terms to get out there, but I could eventually get an estimate of sine of 100,000 radians. Right? No matter how big. Cosine is the same. It's got a factorial that would eventually overcome the exponential. E is the same. It's got a factorial that would eventually overcome the exponential. So no matter how big x is, eventually that factorial would overcome it. And so it's the same. These both converge for all x. Now surely that's not a proof. That's just I kind of feel that way. We'll prove that below. But uh, that's a good start. And then what about 1 over 1 minus x? Surely that wouldn't work for 100. If I tried to put in 100 here and see if it came out to be a finite sum, that's like saying 100 to the 0 plus 100 to the 1st plus 100 to the 2nd plus 100 plus 100 to the 3rd and trying to add all this. Is that a finite sum? Surely not. This would never work. This diverges like crazy. So this certainly does not converge for any old x I want. This, because it has no factorial to fight with the x to the n, we would have to choose x's that didn't get too crazy too big. So what kind of x? Small. Talk to me about small. Less than 1, so negative 20. Absolute value of x less than 1 or between negative 1 and 1, which makes it a lot like what kind of series? Geometric, which it is actually. It, no matter what number I put in, I would get a geometric case. 3 of the n is geometric, 1 half of the n is geometric. So this is a this is a universal geometric series, I guess you could say. All right, now, <coughs> that said, that's not very proof. So let's talk about this. All these Taylor series formulas have the same basic gist of an exponential x minus c to the n over n factorial, and then the derivative is usually just a number, so it's not to worry about. But uh, because every one of these Taylor series has an exponential component and a factorial component, what test would make sense to run? The ratio test. So glad you said ratio test, because if you just said try to do the next four questions, you said, but is that comparison test? Yeah. No, no, maybe. Okay, now this is actually how you 
find what's called the interval of convergence. The interval of convergence is the interval over which, or the range of f studies for which you get an actual finite number. And you could really match this function with its polynomial. Um, so it goes like this. The first thing, let's start with writing it. For sine, which is negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 plus 4 helps plus n is 0. The ratio test says that you should investigate the ratio of a, a later term to the one before it. Now, for this problem here, we're going to use my ratio test. Oh, we've done that a million times. The only small difference here is this has this x in it, and that makes for a little more work, but not too much. So the n plus 1 term, because of the absolute value, this, you don't even go there. I don't care about the negative 1. Nobody writes it. I mean, it doesn't, don't even worry about it, okay? Um, the x, x to the, now if I'm looking at the n plus 1 term, then in place of n, I'm putting in n plus 1. And in the denominator, in place of that n, I'm putting in n plus 1. Way down. And I, the denominator, the nth term is just exactly the same. Uh, which is to say x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. That's perfect. We go. All right. So now, uh, if I were to clean this up a little, that top, isn't it x to the 2n plus 2 plus 1 or 2n plus 3? And the denominator is going to be this. We go. When I bring that denominator up, it's going to flip to put the form on. So it'll be 2n plus 1 factorial and x to the 2n plus 1 down and down here. You see what I did there. All right, now just like before, we're going to try and do a little whoosh, whoosh. Our goal is to take the bigger one down to the level of the smaller so that we can cancel. So we're going to take n to x to the 2n plus 3 and break off the x to the 2n plus 1 so it'll cancel. Now if I take off the 2n plus 1, then what's left? <laughs> x to the 2. Check that. Do you agree with the exponent rule if that's equivalent? Yeah? Okay. That then will go bye-bye. Same with the factorials. I want to strip this down until it's at the level of the 2n plus 1 factorial. So I'm going to break 2n plus 3 up into 2n plus 3, then what? 2n plus 2, and then finally on to the level of 2n plus 1 factorial, which would strip the 2n plus 1 factorial in the numerator. Here's where the limit gets a little funky. Um, no Calc 1 teacher would throw this at a beginning first week Calc 1 student because it would creep them out. But what about the limit as x goes to 5 of y? What's the limit as x goes to 5 of y? Say y. Okay, x, okay, x can go whatever it wants. I, whatever x can go to 5, go to, I don't care. y stays y. Wherever x goes, y stays y because the limit pertains to what x is doing. The other part stays the same. Now, in this case here, x stays. I don't care about x. I am doing the limit on n. As n goes to infinity, dividing by two huge n's in the denominator goes to 0 times whatever x was there. x then it just comes along for the ride. The limit comes out to be 0 x squared. Now, by ratio test, this will converge if the limit is less than 1. That's the test. Now you tell me, for what x value will that be true? 0 times what numbers is less than 1? All numbers. It, all numbers have to be true. Okay? 
Oh, okay. So that's it. That's, no, oh, no, that's not true. That's, that's ridiculous. Sorry. No, zero over zero doesn't cancel. You're about to piss me off. That's equal to zero? Oh, that's one? I, I guess I have two words for you. Multiple rule. That's two words is that for you? No, that's two words. I mean, what's the, that's one of You know what I mean. What the freak is that? Nathan, go back to set 79. Look up over time rule. This is true for all x. Now that is to say, after all that stuff, that means sine of x could be modeled by the series for any x value. Okay? Cosine is very similar. You should be able to do that now. <clears throat> Let's go to e to the x which is x to the n over n factorial. Now, my goal is to use the ratio test to find for what x's this will converge. So I start with the ratio test. I write the n plus 1 term. What is the n plus 1 term? x to the n plus 1 over plus 1 factorial over the nth term, which is x to the n over <coughs> n factorial. This time I'm going to write reciprocal of x to and break it up. So there's an x to the n plus 1, x to the n times x to the first, and n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial. The reciprocal of the denominator is n factorial in the top, x to the n in the denominator. You get a little whoosh. Now it can be the limit. As n goes to infinity, 1 over n plus 1 goes to 0 times the x. And that is true. That should have had absolute value. I don't put in there because it's square. That's true for all x. Pause for a second to make sure you have a clue what the world is going on in this book. e to the x looks like this. It's an incredibly fast-growing function. I just made the claim that I could match that function by getting x to big enough power, no matter how wide out I could find it, I could find an x to the sum power that with enough power would mimic the growth out here, even though it's exponential, with enough x to the billionth power it would start to grow hard like that. And I could make it tail out or flat like that with the right situation. Okay? Uh, we'll finish going over tomorrow. You don't need to put it in. Uh, you might be able to do a little more. Right? And if you want, you can start set 142. Have a nice day.